I am Ben. This is Jerry. Hi, Jerry. Oh, hi. Hi. <laughs> and we are the White House Communications staff and the host for West Wing Weekend. So let us get started. Fans of the West Wing appreciate good writing, civic engagement, and the intricacies of policy making. So this morning, with our esteemed guest, we are going to learn from the people who have walked the walk. Welcome to Real Life in the West Wing. Find out what it's really like to work with legislators to make laws. For chief speech writers for President Bill Clinton and Vice President Gore, please welcome your moderator, Patricia, how do you say your last name? Ariaza. Ariaza. <laughs> Hello, everybody. OK. Handsome, a mic for you. You get your own. I, uh, I want to have my CJ moment, so I'm going to you know, stand behind the podium for a little bit. Uh, I'm going to just take a quick minute or so to make our introductions, because we have a little under an hour, so I know we want to really hear from our guest speakers, and we really want to thank them for taking the time on a Saturday to come and join us. And we also want to give you guys an opportunity to ask questions. So. Um, starting with uh, Stephen Gooden, who served Bill Clinton as the president's aide, managing the president's daily schedule throughout visits to more than 150 domestic cities in over 30 foreign countries. He is currently the founder of Commonwealth Energy Ventures, a boutique consultancy focusing on new business opportunities in energy innovation. And he's um, the second there. David Kuznet was chief uh, speechwriter to Bill Clinton during the 92 campaign and the first two years of the administration. He was also a speechwriter for Walter Mondale and Michael Dukakis and has written speeches for leaders in government and politics and civil and human rights organizations. He has written numerous articles and books, including Speaking American, How the Democrats Can Win in the um, 90s, and maybe later somebody can ask him if he wants to update that. <laughs> um, Bob, uh, so we have David Kuznet on the end there. Bob Learman was the first chief speechwriter for Vice President Al Gore. He has spent much of his career writing speeches for politicians, corporate and nonprofit CEOs, and celebrities. He's also written non nonfiction books, novels, short stories, and op-eds, which have appeared in the New York Times, Washington Post, and many others. He has taught as an adjunct at American University and appears on TV, radio, and other campuses to talk about speech. Mr. Lerman here on the end. And Mr. Monroe is a former editor of CNNPolitics.com, where his work included editorial planning and content strategy. And he led the digital coverage of the 2012 re-election of Barack Obama. He is the founder of the Monroe Media Group, a DC-based media strategy, crisis communication, and personal branding firm. He is professor at Temple University's Klein College of Media and Communications. And he was the personal editor of Unhinged, an insider's account of the Trump White House by Omarosa Manigault Newman. So Mr. Monroe here. So we're going to ask our guests to just spend about five or seven minutes just talking to us about their real world experience working in or with the White House, um, just to get a sense of what that looks, what that looked like. I think we can all say that the West Wing, the show was um, pretty aspirational. Uh, it really gave us an idealistic view of what working in the White House <laughs> could have been like, could be like. Um, and for me, I know that uh, also left me with questions about what was it really like? What does it take to get things done, um, to keep the cogs moving? And um, what those days, those I'm sure very long days and very long weeks looked like. So we're really pleased again that we have the opportunity to, um, to speak to some folks who have experience with that. So we can start with Mr. Lerman here on the end. Okay. Uh, thank you for being interested enough to come hear me, <laughs> and thank you for inviting me. Um, uh, I was uh, in the in the White House from ninety four uh, ninety three to ninety five, and that meant working in old executive office building, which was across the driveway from the West Wing. Uh, usually, I would go over to the West Wing about five or six times a day, um, and it was an exhilarating, awful. Um, and uh, mostly non -for mostly forgettable, non forgettable <laughs> uh, experience. And in addition to thanking everybody else, I have to thank uh, David Kuznet, who hired me and changed my life. Because when uh, Clinton was elected, 
I was working for the majority whip in the House, David Bonnier. I wanted to work for Clinton in the worst way. Well, the best way, actually. <laughs> um, so I had about 75 people send my resumes or call, and David had already been hired as uh, chief speechwriter for Clinton. Um, all those resumes went to him. But I had made a mistake. In the year before, all my friends were going down to Arkansas to do the Clinton campaign. And I would say, that guy's not going to win. Uh, you know, why don't you stay here? And George Stephanopoulos had a great job working for the you know, House leader. Uh, so I stayed put. Uh, then Clinton made a mistake. He cut the White House budget by 25%. And that was his campaign promise, and then he made another mistake. He kept the promise. <laughs> so David called me in, and we knew each other, and he said, I like your work. He said, but, you know, I'm limited. We only have three speechwriters for Clinton, and they have to come from the campaign. So we're, I know who the two are, uh, but it won't be you. So I was completely crushed. And then, David, you said, but I will make you my first choice for Gore. So I went home somewhat elated. And then pretty soon I had my interview and started to work for Gore. He didn't know who I was when I went there because it was Passover. All the Jewish people were out of town, and nobody had told him why I was there. So I realized that after about five minutes, and I said, uh, so anything special you would like to talk about, you know, writing speeches? And suddenly he sort of said, oh, that's who that guy is. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, he said, well, welcome to the staff. So I, I knew I got the job. Now, what was different in that two years about the, from real life and West Wing? One thing I liked about West Wing very much is that that was the first uh, dramatic show or about politics that showed people concerned with issues. And basically, that is what your life consists of. You know, all these movies, about, they're always focusing on corruption. Basically, we would come in, somebody would say, okay, you're doing Sierra Club. Uh, I'd have two hours to brief myself on environmental issues. Maybe I'd talk to Gore about that. Then I'd do some war research, and then I'd do a draft first, and then I go to uh, you know a leg assistant uh, or you know legislative people, and then there would be another speech, and I would work twelve hours a day. Uh, me and I finally got to hire an unpaid intern named Eric Schneer, who has been a partner and colleague and my co teacher at American University, and uh, you know we would work twelve hour days. You know and sometimes. It'd be 10 o'clock at night, and the speechwriters for Gore were on the second floor of old executive. And now it's called the Eisenhower Building, which really offends me because Eisenhower thought that was the ugliest building in Washington. <laughs> and in the 1960s, he had a plan to tear it down. It's so actually, if any of you can make it inside there, and maybe in the next administration, um, it's just it's a wonderful place, you know, with all these staircases winding up. Uh, there's a brass rail on, the sta on one of the staircases above the banister because when Taft was president, he was so fat that he couldn't make his way up the stairs unless he pulled himself up on the brass rail. So that was a big thing that people would point out when we had guests. Um, but the thing that uh, I would look at West Wing and say, well, that's not like it is, is that you know, it was well acted, it was smartly produced. Um, they would have a problem, they'd be talking in the Oval Office, they'd go back to the press room, and they would solve that in 30 seconds of clever dialogue. And I would say to my wife, who was sitting right there, um, <laughs> you know, you could solve that problem, but it would take about two years and you know, 100 meetings and 200 memos, and it would be abandoned and brought up again, and then 
somebody would find some, some way to solve it. That's real life. So there was a big difference between West Wing and real life, and the, but which is fine because what people say about fiction, and I've written novels and I think it's true, is that good fiction is like real life with the dull parts left out. <laughs> and so there were a lot of dull parts left out. And, uh, but there were also spectacular uh, things too. And um, I will just close with one spectacular thing. You know, I have a book on political speech. And uh, when it was coming out, David had written the most famous line in the, you know, the Clinton inaugural, which is, whatever's wrong with America can be fixed by what's right with America. So in the section on sound bites, I wanted to find out uh, how he uh, thought that up. And he said, um, well, he told me. Then he said, but you know, you have a line in there too. I was just speechless. I said, what? He said, yeah, you got a, a line in the inaugural, and he told me the line, which he'll, uh, I'm not gonna repeat because so, it was so ordinary. Uh, he said, uh, and in the first draft, the what's right with America and your line are the only ones that made it to the actual inaugural. So you think one line, one not very distinguished line, shouldn't make you happy? I was so happy that it took about a week <laughs> for that to go, go down. So uh, I am indebted to you for that too, David. And uh, I'll just pass it to yep. whoever Mr. you Monroe, like. thank you. Okay. Oh, you got it. Good stuff. <laughs> um, let's see, I think we got pictures up. Uh, you might be queuing something up. Oh, okay, does this work? Yeah, there we go. You gotta hold it really close. All right, let's yeah. pull this. You want me to move There we go, move. there, is that better? All right. Uh, well, thank you for coming and uh, spending your beautiful sun Saturday morning. It's really nice out there after all the rain uh, here at this, this great conversation. Uh, I've um, been on the other side of the game, which is as a journalist, uh, covering politics and um, uh, the presidency and, and other things around. I did some entertainment stuff. I, um, was, uh, I did both the first interview with Barack Obama after he got elected. Uh, we beat 60 Minutes by a Day, and the last interview with Michael Jackson before he died. And so kind of bookends, <laughs> in, in a way. Um, but there's a whole bunch of stuff in between. I think uh, we were talking earlier, my first campaign, or my first president I covered was when I was in junior high school in Tacoma, Washington. Uh, covered Jimmy Carter. Um, he was at McCord Air Force Base doing something, and, and I'd go out there with my little Pentax K1000 and make some pictures of uh, um, uh, Jimmy Carter. But have covered, you know, Carter, Reagan, um, Bush one, Bush two, uh, Clinton, Obama, and even a piece of Trump right now. Um, <laughs> we'll get into that. <laughs> I don't want to get there. <laughs> uh, and they're all very different, but it was interesting as you compare to the, the fictionalized, uh, the, t the TV show, The West Wing, a couple things stand out. First, as has been said earlier, there is an awful lot of, an idealistic camaraderie feeling from the show that may or may not be as strong in, in any particular White House. Some are stronger than others. Um, you will find good, honest, decent people working in all levels of the White House staff, from the president, vice president, chief of staff, down to uh, an assistant to an assistant to a speechwriter. And um, the people who believe in the country, believe in the mission, and in many cases believe in the candidate or the president. And you'll find folks who are just doing it to get something on their resume, or going to the next step, or um, it's a competition. And being able to see uh, White House after White House, you know, looking at, for instance, the Obama administration, there was a good sense of professionalism and camaraderie there. And you compare it, say, to this, this um, you know, those who read the Bob Woodward book, uh, Fear, it's, it's a lot of backbiting, backstabbing, uh, nobody trusts anybody, and even the project I worked on, uh, where my client had tapes, uh, you know, taping in the White House. That's unheard of since Richard Nixon. <laughs> um, but so I wanted to just kind of walk through, and we can click in any any speed. But you know, this is an image that not a lot of people get to see in the White House, kind of looking out uh, towards the Washington Monument, and um, it kind of gives you the sense that. 
this is a really cool joint. <laughs> it's, uh, I think there's a story that the view from the Oval Office that if you look through the window, it has a, a direct view to the Jefferson Memorial. And they cut, off, they cut out the trees that used to block that because they thought that um, every president needed to wake up every morning and look Thomas Jefferson in the eye. And so there are little things, symbolisms um, throughout the architecture of, of the, the White House. All right, next. Um, so covering every president, you know, this is uh, uh, George Bush. This is interesting because a good friend of mine, Eric Draper, who was uh, George Bush's personal photographer, uh, he and I interned together at the Seattle Times. And I was at some event. He goes, hey, you want to take a picture with the president? I'm like, I, I guess so, OK. <laughs> and so I'm waiting backstage. He was giving a speech and waiting backstage. And I'm standing next to this guy in a nice Navy uniform. And he's got a little, like, sort of duffel bag kind of thing by his feet. And we're sitting there and talking. And um, he goes, hey, keep an eye on that for a second. I'm going to get some water. So he walks over, gets a bottle of water, and comes back. And in a few minutes, comes back. And I'm looking at it. It's got the seal of the president on it. Is, is that what I think it is? <laughs> and he was just looking at me. He goes, <laughs> so it's, you know, they have a good time. Um, next one. Um, you can get the next one. So Bill Clinton, he's uh, fascinating for those, those of y'all who work with him. Uh, again, covering him and being at uh, different events, this happens to be Ed Bradley from 60 Minutes who passed away at the wake after his funeral. And everything you hear about Clinton is true, <laughs> or much of it is, including his energy. Um, I have never, in all the, the, the presidents and prime ministers and, and kings and queens that I've covered, I've never seen someone who is, who is as politically skilled and natural as he is. I mean, he literally walks into a room. This is, so this wake was, it was mainly African Americans in the room, few, few white folks. <laughs> but uh, he came in and instantly owned the room. I mean, his energy, and, and it's true, you've heard the stories, everyone here has worked with him. He'll come up to you, and he'll look you in the eye. For 30 seconds, you are the most important person in the world. And then it'll go to you. <laughs> <laughs> and look you in the eye. And it's, it's a natural, almost like breathing for him. Yeah, he had some other flaws too, but you know. <laughs> um, all right, next. Uh, and then that guy. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, I showed this picture to him uh, a few months ago, and he goes, man, we old now. <laughs> this was in December 2016, just before he and Michelle and the girls got on the plane, December 16th, uh, Wednesday, before he and Michelle got on the plane to go to Hawaii to make the decision to run for president. And uh, we sort of had a feeling he might. I was the editor of Ebony Magazine at the time, so this was in our studios in Chicago. And he's, you know, unlike Clinton, who had some problems with time and chronic, you know, being on time, Obama always on time, right? Like, so he's supposed to be at my office at 5 o'clock, shows up, hands on the doorknob at 5 o'clock. And it's just he and an aide, no security, no entourage, no nothing. Uh, and he comes in. And I had met him before in different events. In fact, I remember when I first met him in 2014. Um, it was March 2014 at the funeral of a founder of, I was the president of the National Association of Black Journalists, and one of our founders, Vernon Jarrett, who was Valerie Jarrett's father-in-law, had passed away, and so it was at his services. And I had to get up and speak for journalists, and then he was the local politician at the time in Chicago, and he got up and spoke, and he was absolutely, positively unremarkable. Um, <laughs> I couldn't remember a thing we met, we talked, and I'm like, okay, yeah, whatever, big, big-eared guy. And, you know, um, and uh, it wasn't until a few months later, I think it was June or July, we're in Boston at the Fleet Center for the DNC, Democratic National uh, Convention. And um, the day before his big speech, I'm standing kind of inside the hall near the stage, and a, a colleague of mine at US News, we we're talking, and Michelle came out. And he had known Michelle, and so he introduced me, oh, this is Michelle Obama. And I said, oh, yeah, I think I met your husband a few months ago or whatever. And, and that was <laughs> it for me. He came out and said, oh, yeah, how you doing, Brian? We talked. The next night was his speech at the DNC that changed history. And I'm like, wow, this guy is remarkable. Uh, and you know, the coverage after that got some great access. So this was um, leading up to, and it was interesting. He, um, so we're talking and sitting in my office, and I walk him around, show him around. Michelle had already gotten there. We did a photo shoot with the two of them. 
And uh, so I stick my head into the little dressing room where she's getting hair and makeup done. I said, uh, Michelle, the, at the time, the senator, the senator's here, about ready to, to do this. And she turned to me and she goes, Brian, I've been waiting on his butt all this time. He's going to wait for me. <laughs> I said, okay, I'll just be over here. <laughs> um, and so, you know, he was very interesting to cover. Next one. Uh, so this is the first interview that we did. It was in the offices of Ebony, which was interesting. I, I had interviewed him many times before, but not as president. And as we're getting off the elevator coming up, you know, he said, I said, you know, congratulations, Mr. President-elect. He goes, oh, I think you might be the first journalist to call me that. Wow, OK. <laughs> but it, it was interesting because as um, normally, you know, once you're a candidate, you have a small entourage. As president, you've got the full, what, 14, 15 vehicle mm -hmm. um, uh, train that comes behind you. And so this, this interview was supposed to be kind of on the down low, but he's coming to our building with this giant entourage, including some of my friends in the press corps. And so they call me like, yo, dude, what are we doing here? I'm like, I can't say. Wink, wink, nod, nod. Um, and it turned out to be he was coming from the secret meeting with Hillary Clinton to offer her uh, Secretary of State. <laughs> and I didn't know that at the time. I had to connect the dots later. Okay. Um, so these are just, I'll run real quickly through some of the covers. This, this one was one of the first covers we did at Ebony um, because this was just after the Des Moines, uh, the, the Iowa caucuses, which he won by surprise uh, to a lot of folks. And I was walking down the streets of Des Moines um, with a couple of colleagues, and he had just won. It was that night. And we had something else in the cover. So it was Black History Month or something. And um, we changed the cover on the fly that night to this because the conversation was, could this actually happen in our lifetime? And it was great during this co coverage of this campaign as well as others because you got a front row seat to history, however it was going to pan out. I talked to colleagues this week who are ca covering the Kavanaugh trial, and that's history in the making right now, no matter where it's going to go. And you know, certainly yesterday was a big, big news day. But the, the great thing about being a journalist in this city covering these issues is that you're literally watching history being made in real time. Um, <laughs> that was one of our more popular covers. <laughs> it's funny, I, was, I would see this on people's t-shirts. I'm like, did I get paid for this? <laughs> and this was our most uh, highest selling issue ever in the history of, mag of uh, Ebony Magazine. This was as he got uh, elected president, where we did the interview that was in that. Okay. Um, oh, that was the cover of, that we did the original shoot with. Um, so covering, traveling with him during the campaign and, and others, um, other campaigns, you you know you fly in the the the, the campaign plane or now if it's uh, Air Force One for the, the president, and they put the press at the back. We come up our own stairs, and um, there's even a pecking order in the press plane. So at the very back um, are the photographers, then it's the print correspondents. Then it's the TV correspondence, then it's the White House, then it's a partition, and it's usually White House staff, then the candidate of the president's up front. Um, and in between the staff and the press is where the Secret Service is. <laughs> um, and so we, you know, as we're, we're landing, everyone's trying to get off the plane real quick, but the, the rule was stay seated until the guys with the guns got off. <laughs> so, all right, we can do that. Okay. Um, you know, and just it's great imagery happening there. Uh, this is in, I think we're in Miami. No, this is in La La Las Vegas, the last few days of the campaign. That's the other thing. I, I've start, I started my career as a photographer, even though I've been a reporter and an editor and some other, other things. So you're naturally, I carry my camera everywhere with this. At CNN here in DC, um, this is the control room on election night. Um, a crazy night. This control room is the new control room right next to the studios. And so you can't see it, but the guy on the far left in the white shirt is kind of blurry. That's Sam Feist. He's the White House bureau chief. I'm the Washington bureau chief, but he's also the, the senior producer for most of the big coverage and events. And as the, head, the editor for digital, I'm sitting right behind him. And the way, particularly on election nights happen, we make a call on, OK, is, is uh, Indiana going to go to this candidate or that candidate? And the call literally comes first from the, um, the folks who are doing the, the exit polls and reading them up to our ears. And then Sam is in um, the ear of Wolf Blitzer, usually, or Anderson Cooper, saying, OK, at the hour, 9.02, we're going to call Indiana for Barack Obama. And I'm on the laptop with all the CNN digital connected with the news alert that you get on your phones. And literally, my finger's hovering over the return key. 
And so you see the, the titles roll, you hear the, the sound, the song, the, the music. Wolf comes on and says, CNN is now projecting that Indiana is going for return. And it happens that quickly in real time. And that's been fascinating watching in DC both in the media and in the White House itself. You talked earlier about some decisions take a long time to make. Others are surprisingly fast. I mean, happen like that. And, and so the speed at which things can happen, is, it's, it's fascinating. Okay. Mr. Monroe. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, can I? Um, I'll wind it up. Yeah, um, thank you. Yeah, jump off this one. You always see my ugly face. Uh, <laughs> the last point I want to make is the, the show, The West Wing, makes it look like the White House is huge. Yeah. It ain't. <laughs> this is the uh, e, uh, e, old executive office building in the background yep. with the, right in front of the West, the West Wing. Yeah, Next. Um, oops, skip over that. Uh, this is the CNN booth downstairs in the basement of the White House. That's where all the press is. This is about the size of four phone booths. And there are five people that work out. This is my friend Jim Acosta. Um, and this is where we work during the day. Then we come upstairs to the press room. Um, and, um, and that's out in front of the West Wing itself. It's pretty small. All these walk and talks that you see in the show? Yeah. No. <laughs> You're kind of like this in Elbows. It's pretty close. Okay. I'll leave it there. That's, that's yeah. inside the press room. Thank you Thank very you. much for that. Thanks for getting. Thanks. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Um, as, as was said, I'm Stephen Gooden, and I was uh, the president's aide from 1994 until 1997. And I also brought some images to share. Uh, if we can bring those up. <laughs> Presto. <laughs> Almost. <laughs> Anybody else hear the Jeopardy music? <laughs> so I've already said that. I, it, uh, the next slide, if you'll just uh, indulge me, I want to dedicate this to my father, Joe Gooden. Today he would have been 78, but he passed away last year. His service as a police officer and a registered nurse in the emergency room really uh, imbued my family with a sense of public service. So uh, just thank you for that. Next one. OK, I'm 27, and this is my business card. <laughs> Right? Um, well, I was going to say a little more about that. I mean, it doesn't take long to read it, but um, I, you know, I may seem a little irreverent, and uh, and I am, and that's kind of one of my coping mechanisms from that time. But have no doubt that I certainly appreciate the honor and the thrill that it was to work on the White House staff, and certainly to be the person with a demonstrative adjective next to President's aide. And what what's important about that, and um, to understand the role, and of course this is a role that Charlie Young was a character on the, on the series, uh, the President's aide is kind of like Tigger. There's only one. <laughs> there are five military aides who carry the nuclear football. Um, there are uh, several Secret Service agents who are always on the President's body at any time. There are, there's a press secretary, deputy press secretary, multiple deputy chiefs of staff. There's only one President's aide. And that's both um, by design and uh, maybe designed to torture you, but <laughs> you really are an appendage of the president himself, or hopefully herself someday, um, because you, you, you function as a part of their brain that they hopefully don't have to use. Um, and the way I describe the job on a day-to-day -day basis is basically every morning or every night before, he and I would receive the same binder full of materials. And it was our job to get through the day that that binder represented together. And let me tell you, it almost never happened the way it was designed in the binder. And I can also tell you that he rarely had time to read everything that was in the binder, so therefore I had to do that. So I'm going to share some images, and I want to thank the White House photographers who took these images. Uh, these four people took all the images that you're about to see. So the next one. Um, so there are a lot of things that you have to be to be the president's aide. And I think one of the similarities to the show, Charlie had uh, history as being a waiter, and I think that's very helpful. Here I just finished the beverage service to four leaders of uh, heads of state, Tony Blair, Helmut Kohl, and um, uh, Hashimoto, sorry, the Prime Minister of Japan. Next, please. You have to be a detective. Here I am <laughs> looking through my peephole into the Oval Office. Betty Curry is there, Miss Lanahan in the series, of course. 
And I, I jealously guarded this peephole. This was not for other people to, to you know, take advantage of the president's privacy, but it was an important tool for me to know what was going on and whether it was the right time to, to uh, do something. And an example would be any time the president had a very large decision to make, President Clinton, of course, I'm talking about, um, any time he had a, a decision to make, he became the merchandiser in chief. He started rearranging all the little knickknacks and, and trinkets that were around the Oval Office. So you know, there are statues and books, and each president brings their own set. But that was his nervous way of thinking about a big decision. And the decisions are big because literally sometimes the president makes a decision knowing that people are going to die or likely die because of that decision. Next, please. You have to be able to get the president's attention. Next, please. You have to be comfortable not getting the president's attention. <laughs> He's very good at ignoring people. Um, you have to be able to stay calm in the eye of the storm, and David will completely appreciate this. Here I am trying to make sure that the speech cards for press availability are in the right order, with the press bearing down on us in a matter of seconds. Does the president or the vice president look concerned in the least? No, they do not. Next, please. You have to be persistent. Um, even though phone calls with different world leaders are organized by the Situation Room and have no fewer than 20 people involved in making them happen, sometimes you call and they say, I'm sorry, the Prime Minister's not available right now. That's very pleasing uh, information to Bill Clinton, as you can see. <laughs> Next. You have to be kind of the, the uh, case manager in, in chief for the country. I followed him around rope lines all over this country, and you know, if there's someone who had an issue or a question, or a grievance, or just a story that he couldn't finish hearing, that was my job to take it down. Next. You have to be able to literally and figuratively see what's around the corner. <laughs> Next. You do have to walk and talk, although to your point, <laughs> this is on the colonnade connecting the West Wing with the main residence of the White House. It's one of the few places where you actually can pull off a walk and talk, and, and when you're running behind and trying to brief someone, this is kind of the only way to do it. So. That's the one situation where I think the walk and talks would make sense. Next. You have to, you have to know your stuff. Uh, all the presidents are smart. Bill Clinton is the smartest person I've ever met by far. And he will ask you questions if he doesn't think you have it right. So you have to know the protocol of this legislative letter that he's about to sign and is it properly addressed. Of course, I, was made, I wasn't really smart. I was made to look smart by the magic binder that gave me all the information. Next. You have to be very succinct. So I think in this age, you, would you might show the president something on your phone or something, but the index card was my best friend. And I, I needed to be able to convey to him what he needed to know and what he needed to do in an index card kind of style. So here we are with another phone call with a world leader. So you see the vice president there, a couple of members of the National Security Council staff, including Sandy Berger, uh, who was National Security Advisor, but has passed away, unfortunately. Next. You have to blend into the background. Um, here I am sound asleep on Air Force One while the National Security Council is meeting. Uh, I'm told that they tried to wake me up and they were not successful, obviously. And so they figured that, that I had my headphones on so I wasn't really gonna break any secrets anyways. Next, please. You have to be resourceful. So this was an Oval Office address. Um, the president shows up and he's got blood on his collar. He cut himself shaving, something that many, many of us do uh, uh, who shave. And he was ticked off about something else, but also about the blood. So I thought, hey, liquid paper. Let's put liquid paper on the blood. Um, yeah. So I'm sad to say it didn't really work, and it ruined the shirt. But it bought time for the valets to bring a fresh shirt over, and it certainly gave people a laugh. So it broke, it broke the tension. Next. Oh, a command came up? Okay. Okay. So I think you can tell, I, as I said, I totally appreciate the honor of this, but my coping mechanism was just having a laugh and not taking things too seriously. So this is a pool spray, it's called, in the Oval Office. Whenever the president, uh, most often the president e meets with a head of state or has some other high profile meeting, the press comes in in this mad scrum. I mean, it is just chaos, especially when your foreign press is there. <laughs> Um, and, uh, you know, they come in and film, film what he says at the top of the meeting, and that oftentimes becomes the message or the news of the day, and it's oftentimes used as an opportunity to respond to news where you need to get the president on record about something. But sometimes you can have a little laugh about it, too. Next, please. Okay, so um, to Bob's point, I think that history is just comp 
comprised of a thousand little jigsaw puzzle pieces. And I think, it, I think I can speak for all of us in saying that none of us are gigantic pieces, but it sure gives us a lot of pride to be small pieces of it. This image is a, uh, a summit held with President Clinton, Yasser Arafat, King Hussein, Hosni Mubarak of Egypt, who, who's uh, obscured in the picture, and Yitzhak Rabin before he was assassinated. This was actually the week before he was assassinated. And one of my jobs as a president's aide was kind of the last point of quality control. And so when the president's going to be on camera, I have to make sure that he looks right, hence taking care of the blood on the collar. So here I am briefing all the leaders where to stand, reminding them. And I look at President Clinton and his tie's a little off. And I say, Mr. President, you know, you got to straighten your tie a little bit. And next photo. So that resulted <laughs> in everybody following suit. <laughs> and uh, Barb Kinney, who's one of the photographers, won an award for this photo. Uh, she entitled it Primping for Peace. She gave me a signed copy as a going away gift. And, you know, it, it literally, uh, the happenstance uh, falls into uh, play here, too, because Yasser Arafat doesn't wear a tie. He wears a kind of military, or did wear, he's passed away now, too. Um, actually, three of these guys are passed away, and one of them is in prison, I believe. <laughs> and President Clinton's still going fairly strong. Um, anyway, Arafat didn't wear a tie, but we, Barb and I, happened to be standing on that side of the room, as you can see from the other photos. So she was in the perfect position and the perfect angle to capture this when everybody started mimicking President Clinton, um, primping for peace. So um, that's, that's all that I wanted to share, and uh, look forward to any questions that you guys have. Well, thank you. Can, can everybody hear me? I, I have to admit, it's always been a fantasy of mine to have one of these handheld mobile microphones. They, you, you know better than I, but I think they were really made to order for candidate and President Bill Clinton because if he was addressing an audience, he'd want to move around. He'd want to, you know, if someone answered a qu question, he'd want to meet, literally and figuratively, meet them halfway. So he couldn't use one of those mics. He'd have to use one of these mics. I'd, li I'd like to begin by doing, for a number of reasons, doing a shout out to the people I were in, in addition to Bob Lehrman, who I worked with during two years in the White House for, for President Clinton as, as speechwriters. They were, and they also give you a sense, among other things, of the kinds of backgrounds that people bring to, the, to that kind of work in the White House. There was Alan Stone, who had been a speechwriter on the campaign, and prior to working in the Bill Clinton campaign, he had been speechwriter for Tom Harkin, who was one of the other candidates for the Democratic nomination in 1992. And Alan was, in addition to everything else, a walking history lesson, particularly with the Democratic Party. He had worked as a policy aide for both Senator Hubert Hum and Vice President Hubert Humphrey and for Senator George McGovern. And after leaving the White House, he was a vice president at Columbia University and later at Harvard. Okay. Of the other, the four, four of us who were senior presidential speech writers by the second year, the, and, and the third one was Carolyn Curiel, who had been a journalist. She had worked at the, on the desk, foreign desk at the Washington Post. She had worked at the New York Times. She had written for Ted Koppel on Nightline. And she brought what I think is the best background for a presidential speechwriter. It was a background that she shared with Peggy Noonan, who had been a speechwriter, famous speechwriter for President Reagan and the first President Bush. Carolyn Curiel wrote words that were meant to be spoken by Ted Koppel, not just words that were meant to be read. And that is probably the best background for a speechwriter. And the fourth was Allison, or as we called her, Alyssa Muscatine, who was speechwriter for then First Lady Hillary Clinton. And that was very much a policy job, and she also wrote presidential speeches. Alyssa had worked at the Washington Post. I think her last job there was as a speechwriter, was as a sports writer. And together with Bob Learman, she wrote the best letter of application that I ever got <laughs> during that season where she wrote to me and she said she had never been a speech, being a good journalist, she could write a great lead. She wrote she had never been a speechwriter. 
She had never worked in politics. She didn't have any powerful friends in politics, but she liked to write things that people would pay attention to. It was just such a great lead that I was tempted to hire her right on the spot. <laughs> now, one, one reason I'm mentioning those four names, or four counting me, is so that you, you don't get a misimpression just from this panel. That was our, our, our starting team of, of senior presidential speech writers was half women. And that reflected the staffing, or certainly what we aspired to in the staffing in the Clinton administration. And I think as we saw, as we've seen during the past week, and as you see in, I think in, in, the, in, the, in West Wing episodes, the issue of who's in the room is very important. Because if a viewpoint isn't represented in the room where the decisions are made, it's probably not going to be reflected in the decisions that are made. A second reason for mentioning those four names, while it may sound like a lot of people, as was mentioned, President Clinton came into office with a promise to cut the White House staff by 25%. He kept that promise, including with the speechwriters. Most presidents before and since have had at least six senior speechwriters. We had four, one of whom also worked for the First Lady. And to say the least, we were very busy. And I don't know if there's been a president, you would know better than I, but I don't know if there's been a president before or since who spoke as often as President Clinton did. In fairness, there hasn't been a, probably hasn't been a president before or since who had less need of prepared remarks to give a great speech. But still, we were very busy, even if we were writing the remarks and in the news. And that has an impact on my relationship to the show the West Wing, which is that I was, very, I was very tired when I left the White House after two years in the White House and about a half year in the campaign. And at first, when West Wing came out, I just couldn't bear to watch it. Because just watching it, I got very tired imagining, <laughs> imagining what, you know, the people portrayed in were, were, do, were working at and how long they were working, you know, in, in the dull moments when they're just sitting at their keyboards and the, that aren't captured in the series. So it took me a while to bring myself to watch and appreciate the West Wing. And when I watched it, it's clearly one of the best shows that's ever been on television. I'm saying that not just because it portrays the kind of work that I, that I had the honor of doing. But it, it, it seemed to me that a frequent plot device there and you all can correct me if I'm wrong, because you probably have watched more West Wing than I can bring myself to watch, <laughs> was the idea that the White House is this and I never had that kind of power when I worked in the White House. I'm not going to put my hand down again. <laughs> but but the, I, I think it's sort of a, an understandable assumption of the show was that the White House is and was sort of the nerve center of policy and, and public events, not only in this country, but throughout the world. And that people, you know, if you work, if you're the president or a cabinet member or a presidential aide, you go to a meeting and you have, you know, the best information at your disposal of anyone in this, in this city, in this country, in this world, on this planet about what's going on, and that therefore, with that kind of command of the knowledge of policy and politics, the debate is between what is good and moral and just, and what is politically expedient. And it seemed to me, and you, you all can correct me if I'm wrong, that very often the plot of West Wing would be that the senior aides would be arguing more for what was pragmatic. And there'd be some young person that somehow managed to get into the meeting who would be arguing for what was moral. And that the charm of the show was that very often the president would come down on the side of what was moral and not what was expedient. And I would say from my limited experience with such meetings as well as my lengthy experience with sitting in the keyboard and trying to put that, what came out of those meetings into words. First of all, there isn't that kind of knowledge maybe with the improvement in communications technologies there is now, but 
from what I saw, whether it was foreign policy or domestic policy, that really wasn't that kind of knowledge. The president, I mean, the White House is more like a newsroom, you know, where stuff is coming in and you're trying to process it and make sense and sort of sort out what may be like not completely <coughs> accurate or what might be. It was more like a newsroom than a faculty room. You know, there was, my, there was just a lot of information to process. People had little pieces of it. And you really were not sure what the facts were. And the second thing was that nobody really had complete knowledge either of what was good and just and moral or of what would be politically expedient. Now, I would say, as, I, as I've said at other gatherings, that I was 50% a Clinton Democrat and 50% a Democrat happened to be working for Bill Clinton. And there were policy issues which, as he knew to the extent that he knew me, and he being just a, the ultimate people person, he knew everybody, where I did not agree with him. I did not support NAFTA. I was more skeptical than he was about welfare reform. I was more on the social investment side of the budget debates than the budget box side of the budget debates. He knew that and assumed that, and anything he read that I wrote, he tried he would revise it, keeping that in mind. But I did not for one moment think, and you, you could argue that some of those positions were politically expedient. Maybe some of them weren't. I think there's a straight line from NAFTA to Donald Trump. So I, I, I think that, that, that NAFTA was wrong, both as policy and as politics. But I never for one minute doubted then or now that President Clinton believed in what he was doing, that he believed in NAFTA, he believed, not because of his why, why he wanted to become president, he believed because of the budgetary situation that we found ourselves in, that he could not keep all his commitments on domestic public investment. And he believed in having had some success with it in Arkansas and having grown up with a single mother who found new meaning and purpose in her life when she learned how to be a hospital technician and was able to support her two kids. He believed in welfare reform. So what he was doing was not, as has sometimes been portrayed, making trimming on policy issues for political expediency. He believed in what he was doing. And just seeing that photograph of Tony Blair there, and, and I'm reminded of something Tony Blair said, right? even he was well to the right of most people in the British Labor Party. He said, what my opponents in the party don't understand is I really believe in this stuff. And I think that's true of, of President Bush and President Clinton as well. And I, I just think, I close out, and so, sorry for taking so long, I close out with just with that issue that I began with of who's in the room. You're probably all wondering, how do you get to work in the White House? What kind of people are in the room? And a few of the, any president, you know, there's the old saying, if two people agree on everything, one of them isn't necessary. You know, presidents at their best have some <coughs> diversity, not just of, uh, you know, how, what people look like, but what people think like. And among the tensions, I think, in any administration, I think the challenge is to make them a creative tension, is at least in the first few years between the campaign people, which I clearly was, and the people who are policy people. You know, people who know how to write a stump speech and the people who actually know policy. That's a tension. Another tension because most presidents come in after winning party primaries and then unifying the party, is between different viewpoints even within their own party, much less when they bring in people from the other party. And I've always thought, to give the devil his due, that at least when it came to speechwriters, the one who got that best was Richard Nixon, because he consciously chose speechwriters, some of whom are still known to this day, because they represented different elements of his, as well as being great writers because they represented different elements of his coalition. Pat Buchanan was the red meat conservative then and now. William Sapphire was a moderate who had not even been a Republican for some, for some of his life, who knew how to explain things in plain English. A man named Raymond Price, who had been editorial page editor of the old New York Herald Tribune, represented the moderate establishment <coughs> Republicans. There was a guy who I got to meet in the guard part because no one else was terribly interested in talking to him, who was a man named Bill Gavin, who had been a factory worker and then a school teacher in New Jersey, 
just sent in material to Nixon during the campaign. Nixon liked, liked what he was sent in. And he sort of, I think more than Pat Buchanan has gotten credit for it, Bill Gavin represented the blue collar, had a feel for the blue collar workers who became Nixon Republic, you know, so the Nixon Democrats, then the Reagan Democrats, and you know, their children and their grandchildren, I think too many of them from my point of view voted for Donald Trump. So it's important to get a mix of people working for you philosophically as well as demographically and to know when and how to use them and to play them off against each other in these internal debates. And I guess that's the point I'd, you know, I'd want to leave you all with, at least at this moment, that to the extent that there's debate in an administration, not dissension and distrust, as has been chronicled, but honest, respectful debate, that's a good thing. And good outcomes come from it. Fantastic. Thank you for that. So I've got a question. So while I ask my question, you guys can uh, craft your own and then please raise your hand if you uh, would like to be called on. Oh, you, okay. I'm sorry. There's a mic over there. All right. So you can um, get to the front. So my question, there's a, an episode where Will says to Charlie that he wants everything that President Bartlett has ever said out loud in his life. So I was wondering in writing speeches or editing a, editing a book, how do you ensure you've captured or preserved the person's voice? How do you learn how to write or edit for that person? Mr. Lerman? Um, well, you can't get everything that a president has ever said or <laughs> uttered in his voice. But we did meticulously keep every scrap of you know, speeches that were given, speeches, you know, talking points, uh, all my notes. I took, if I was in a speech conference, which if I did five speeches a week for Gore, uh, it would be one which was major, and we'd have speech conferences as I come back. And then the, you know, the uh, others, I might poke my head in his door and say, well, we're doing a, a Sierra Club. What do you, you know, what would you like to say? And he'd give me a minute's worth, and I'd go off. Uh, well, we kept those. And whenever he did something memorable, whether it was a joke, all the stiff jokes we had to create for him, um, that went in what was called the anecdote book. And when I left, I took a copy of that anecdote book with about 500 really nice things that you could use. And if it wasn't plagiarism, if it wasn't something he invented, which it usually wasn't, I still use them. <laughs> so those, those are valuable. But I want to give you a sense of some things that were just will sound impossibly primitive today. When David and I started working, we didn't have the internet. There was no internet. I remember when it came in, I think it was September 94, and they showed us this amazing tool. I didn't know how to handle it. I, we had interns. They had to go up to the fourth floor, an old executive, and look at books, actual books, you know, <laughs> um, and do research. That was an amazing change. Uh, and the second thing was security seems so lax. We were talking about this before. You know, people were rollerblading outside the White House. You know, the street wasn't cut off. Um, one time, a guy brought an AK-747 to, you know, the front gate, and I think he leaped over and started shooting at the press co at the uh, press office. Uh, and I think a passerby, I think some, you know, not the uh, Secret Service guys jumped him, if I remember right. Um, it was, you know, just so amazingly different. Although, I did have an intern one time who was supposed to deliver something to Gore's office. She ran across the driveway, up the steps into West Wing, and right by the security guard who leaped up and tackled her. <laughs> and <laughs> what are you doing? Who are you? <laughs> um, that, is, that is really different. And then, um, so uh, I wish we'd preserved more, though I did, I did keep a journal of those days, which we were told not to do, because <laughs> one of the staff in Treasury Department had kept a journal and it was subpoenaed. 
So I really didn't do that. That's a big lie. <laughs> <laughs> so that was keeping a journal, but now we've got a situation where people were keeping tapes. <laughs> so. <Yeah>. Right. <laughs> yes, Mr. Just to pick up on first the question and some of the, the stories. With the, with the question, when I, when I think getting, the, getting the, per, the voice of the person you're writing for <clears throat> is absolutely the most important thing you can do. And I, I was hired to work for the, for the candidate Clinton in June of 1992, right when he was winning the California primary and clinching the nomination. I, I moved out to Little Rock and you know, tried, first of all, tried to get myself to do as many meetings as possible with him so I could hear his voice. And then ask the, this is sort of the question, the, the question that, you know, that was asked about whether you can get everything that someone ever said. Ask the press secretary's office, his press secretary, his governor of Arkansas, if there were any texts of speeches that Clinton had given him. I was told, you don't understand, this man doesn't use texts. <laughs> so there were a few transcripts of State of the State speeches he had given in Arkansas. And there was one other document that was an absolute treasure trove, which was a colloquy between him and Bill Moyers for Atlantic Magazine. They, they, someone had done a transcript of that. And that was just absolutely, short of being around Bill Clinton in person, and this was, you know, speaking of technology, this was before YouTube, so that you couldn't just get videos of, of any public figure and listen to them to your heart's content. Short of that, getting the transcript of him talking to Bill Moyers was absolutely the best way to get the best of Bill Clinton's voice, because here you had two liberal Southern Baptists talking to each other. Bill Moyers, in addition to everything else he's done in his life as an ordained minister, he worked for President Johnson and sort of represented the best aspect of Lyndon Johnson. And he was drawing out Bill Clinton about their common culture as white Southern Baptist liberals from the South. You know, I mean, redundant from the South. And he just got a sense of how Clinton talked about social justice, how he talked about the religious faith, which he admitted he came to as a sinner and how he talked about his own life in his own voice. It just was, short of hearing him actually speak those words, it was just the best way to get a sense of his voice. And I remember just picking out phrases, and I'd almost use the filter. If he's saying, if he's talking differently from the way I would naturally talk, that was the real Bill Clinton, I had to get it. He talked about doing things with a joyous spirit. You know, and I, I remember using that phrase, and, he really beamed when he saw it on a text. And he probably thought I had some kind of window into his soul that he couldn't understand because I had read, you know, literally hundreds of pages of him, a transcript of him talking with Bill Moyers. Now the point about the internet is when Bob and I were working in the White House, you didn't even have internal email. Or you did, but people who were younger than we were, even then, were the only people who know how to use it. So even if you were at our exalted level, or what we imagine was our exalted level in the hierarchy, <laughs> we had to go and photocopy our stuff. When we were getting clearances, we had to go and photocopy our stuff and then walk it around the, the, the West Wing and the OELD, Eisenhower Building. And I sort of wonder what, what current speechwriters do or, we don't have to do that because only they can just send attachments in, in the internal email. And for me, there was an opportunity to smooth a whole lot of people. And I would be walking something around, you know, somebody would, in the building, in the building, somebody would see me walking it around and beckon me in and I get to explain what it was and get to talk to them. So it was, it was time well spent, in my view. And sometimes you just got the unique experiences of, of working in the White House. And part of it was, you know, as been said, it's not a terribly big building. You know, they're not, you take. And also there's a lot of unmarked, at least as of 93, 94, 94, 93, 90, 94, 1995. Can you all hear me? There was, there were a lot of unmarked rooms and you couldn't put people moved around a lot. You couldn't quite tell who would be where. So I, I remember one, one afternoon I was walking 
a speech draft around in the West Wing, and there was some room where I thought there was some big shot there to work there, not to be hanging out there. So I open up the door, and I'm reminded of this by seeing Rabin and King Hussein and Yasser Arafat. I open up the door, and there is Shimon Peres sitting by himself <laughs> in, at, a, at, a, at a table. And I, you know, I had this instant reaction that you know, it really is Shimon Peres. I hope he doesn't think I'm here to do him harm. <laughs> so I couldn't think of what to say, so I said shalom and closed the door. <laughs> and that, that kind of thing would happen, that you would just run into people who you had we, we, you thought you recognized, because everyone at one point or another comes to the White House. You run into people you thought you recognized and be at a loss as to what to say to them. And I guess to tell a story of involving the Vice President, the then Vice President staff, who were, you know, much more, much better organized, much more punctual than we were. I, used, I made a point thinking that Al Gore would be the next President of the United States. I made a point of assigning myself the Earth Day speeches. And I brought no particular background to or knowledge <laughs> or history of activism to those assignments. And the Vice President staff had the portfolio for environmentalism. And they were good enough to be what they called my Sherpas, my guides to environmental issues. And pretty much we outsourced everything except the actual delivery of the, of the Earth Day speech to Vice President Gore's staff, and they were wonderful to me. But one time I think they got fed up with how much I was draining their time and energy and how unpunctual the Clinton and the staff and our principal were. So I had a meeting with the vice, I had the same experience that Bob Lerman had. I had a meeting with the vice president and to discuss the Earth, Earth Day speech. And I was sitting there in the waiting room and I realized that none of the vice president's staff were there and I tried, that was before text messaging, but you could beat people, I was beeping them frantically and they were not responding. So they had left me alone to meet with the vice president about the Earth Day speech, about which I knew absolutely nothing, except that I had written it up from the information they gave me. And this was one of these, you know, waiting room areas in the in the West Wing, where every big shot from the political, business, even cultural worlds might be that might be there, and there was a man sitting there who looked to me like Norman Mailer, the novelist. And I didn't have, I, 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 I tend to hold cultural figures in more awe than political figures. I did not have the courage to go up to him and ask him if he was Norman Mailer. <coughs> and, but it, it looked to me like Norman Mailer, and it, I thought that maybe he might actually be meeting with the vice president, because they both went. Went to, they both went to Harvard, they both served in the military, they both wrote books, so I thought maybe he'd be meeting with him. So here I am, I'm ushered into the Vice President's office to discuss a speech that I cannot explain the content of to someone who knows the content backwards and forwards. I'm waiting for his staff to show up, so I just take, in my mind, I just take a flyer, but I say, I thought I saw Norman Mailer out there. And I'm right, the Vice President is a fan of, of Norman Mailer, so he starts talking about Norman Mailer. And I remember a story about when President Kennedy met Norman Mailer and did what smart politicians do with authors, which is talk about their more obscure books, not their more famous books. So Kennedy didn't talk to him about The Naked and the Dead. He talked to him about a book called Barbary Shore, and Mailer loved him forever after. So I told the Vice President that story, and he laughed. He said he read them all. So anyhow, we had a lovely discussion about Norman Mailer's novels until the Vice President's staff, policy staff, finally showed up, and we could have a serious discussion about the Earth Day speech. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. You know, and it's interesting, the, just, the, the difference that technology has made. That'll um, be a couple of minutes, I'm yeah. sorry, Justin. Um, you know, sitting here right now, we, there's a thing that you probably were of the, the press pool, um, where in many events, there's not space for every, you know, hundreds of people who cover the White House to cover a certain event, especially a, a gaggle or a, a veil in the, in the West Wing, so you have a, 
a print reporter, a TV reporter, a TV camera, an audio person, just a few folks to cover it. And um, you know, to this day, I was sitting here as we were talking, you get the press pool reports on your phone. And you know, Trump right now is somewhere, you know, leaving the White House, the presidential motorcade is oh, golf. heading out. Oh, golf, yeah. On a bright all day, 9.57 a.m. And this is Barbara's, it's that real time. And this real time did not happen, you know, certainly in the, uh, in previous administrations. And even the use of everything from email, what, Clinton only sent one or two emails? Oh yeah, yeah. He, he just, he only got a computer on his desk after I left yeah. in the final year. And whereas you have Trump who's tweeting four times a morning. <laughs> and you know, it's, it's <laughs> night and day. Okay, so uh, we'll have one quick question and then, uh, oh, two, all right, we'll do the two quick questions. And Yes. In the West Wing, you know, Charlie comes in and there's like, he just shows up, right? Yeah, so um, first of all, you know, being a body person is what they call that role more generically. And in, in politics, it's very common that any candidate has a body person. And so there's kind of an um, unchristened club of people who do that writ large and certainly who do it for particular people. So there were four of us who <coughs> had the role under President Clinton and we are still in contact today. And the last person who had the um, role in the Clinton administration, Doug Band, um, worked very closely with the Bush people coming in to help educate them and, and give them some guidelines about the job. But one of the things, there, there really is, there's not a lot um, studied about the role. In fact, when I, when I took it, I, went, I walked over to the library over in the old executive office building and tried to research what I could learn from pe past people who had the job and actually reached out to some previous president's aides, uh, one of whom, Bill, Bill Farish, who had done it for Herbert Walker Bush, it has huge car lots all over Virginia, if you happen to live in that area. So he definitely uh, went into the right business. But So there is kind of a unwritten club of those people. Uh, you know, we stay close with each other when we worked for President Clinton. We're likewise close to the people who did it for, with Mrs. Clinton, because we spent a lot of time with them. And frankly, there are a lot of, there are a lot of experiences that you can share with those people that might sound snarky or, or inappropriate or uh, misunderstood to anybody else that you can only share within that kind of cone of people. Um, and, and obviously you're exposed to a lot uh, around these individuals. Yeah, I think yeah, you need to work as a team in the, in the White House because there's so much stuff to do. And, and, and actually, there was one thing that we do that um, I hope continues after 2020. Uh, we fact-checked. <laughs> you know, we, we really did. And not just if a statistic was right, but if we generalized, was that appropriate? You know, or was it uh, a hasty generalization based on too little facts? Uh, that took a lot of going around. You know, we didn't just email something. I had to walk over and say, could you look at this and tell me if it's right? So if you don't work as a team, uh, you really can't produce the kind of, kind of work that, that you should. Can I add one thing? One I'm sorry, oh. I, I would be remiss if I didn't, I didn't address one dimension of your question. So there's no doubt that the president's aid is supported by a huge number of people, most of whom are actual e either military service people or career service people. So one point is that the staff of the, of the White House only the very top of that pyramid are political appointees. The huge majority of people who work at the White House are career service people or military people detailed to the White House. They're very dedicated, they work very hard, they do all the supporting work, and the political staff draws on their work. Oh, I want to say one more thing about that, which I'd be remiss if I didn't. Um, people actually in different administrations helped each other. When I came in, my predecessor, was John McConnell, who worked for Quail. So he was out in Indiana or someplace, and I just called him and said, is there anything you can tell me about how the job worked? He was great. You know, he just, you know, he, we talked for about an hour. I was taking notes. You know, he called back. You know, he's now in Washington now. Of course, I couldn't stand his boss, and he was against just about everything that Bill Clinton was for, but we shared this common experience, mm -hmm. and he could not possibly have been more candid or more helpful. And 
Uh, in those days, it may sound unbelievable, but Republicans and Democrats could somewhat talk to each other. Do everything. <laughs> um, so, I, like David, I was a little raw on the White House experience when the television show started. So I didn't watch The West Wing, and I was like, "Really? Are people going to watch this?" And over time, I appreciated it. But as I <clears throat> watched it from afar, I think Charlie came in to interview as a bike messenger on the show, and I was like, "A bike messenger." Um, there is an experience that most, most of the people who end up in that job um, come out of the kind of scheduling advance world of campaigns, and that's where I came out of. I was the acting advance director on the Clinton campaign. I, I started in New Hampshire in 1991, and uh, Cindy Kohler is here who worked with me during that campaign. And, um, you know, uh, the, the main tripwires that would invoke the president aid having to be on the job are any time it's important for the president to be on time or any time he's going to be in front of the press. So having that background of scheduling in advance where you can appreciate logistics and the, the importance of imagery and uh, the detail-oriented nature of preparing for presidential events, I think that's where most of the people who go into that job have experience in that vein. That, that's how I came to it. Okay. So we're just going to have one quick question, if we can keep it to like two minutes, because I mean, we want to honor their, their commitment and their time. Kevin, I think you had. Uh, actually, she covered. Oh. I wanted to okay. talk to Stephen about how he got into the role of uh, Charlie Susan. Right. How okay. he got the job. And uh, okay. Of the Great. Okay. So we'll take. Uh, yes. Then I'll. And then yeah, we gotta wrap okay. it up for. So on the show, um, everybody's very interdependent, and so I feel like all four of your respective characters were talking to each other a lot, meeting with each other. The press kind of were coming in out of CJ's office. The president's aide was talking to the speech writers. Well, for me, it would be any nexus with the president or anything that came from him where I had to go, had to take it out to the other direction. So, for example, David may be working on a on a, an important speech, and I know that he said some, the president made some comment about, oh, we ought to think about this for that speech that's coming up. Then it would be incumbent on me to kind of feed that back to David, or he might say, I need to get together with David about that speech and bring it back. And likewise, I would try to give. I did this more as I was in the role longer because I trusted myself more, but I, w I would see every speech that he would make. So I wasn't recording it, but I would see which riffs worked and which riffs didn't. And I also got to see which paragraphs he <laughs> frequently would mark out. And I could say, hey, he just chunked that paragraph from the speech the other day and hopefully try to save them some time and some trouble. That's great. OK. Great, so I'm going to say there's a great story. I, I honestly forget who, <laughs> who this happened to, of a speechwriter getting a draft of a speech that went to President Clinton where that X mark was on every page <laughs> and maybe there was no oh, no. <laughs> in the margin. And the, and the speech writer saved it as a souvenir. <laughs> All right, this has been fantastic. Thank you. Let's thank everybody. Thank you very much.